time to talk about AI. Yeah, yeah. And if you think it's anything else, you are flat wrong. So that's important for you to know. Um, so good, good afternoon. Um, if, if you are here because you are super excited about AI and like regulations and law, raise your hand. OK, cool. If you are here because you have decided and pre-committed to going to the cocktail hour and you need something to fill 40 minutes of your time, raise your hand. And if you are here because we work together and so you feel some sort of moral or social obligation, raise your hand. All right, this is like actually like every use case. And the guys in the back, like I think you're just like non-participatory or non-conforming. And I'm fine with that too. So welcome. Uh, when I submitted this talk, I didn't think it would get picked up. And that's an important element for everyone here to know. <laughs> but I was like, it sounds really cool. Like, that'd be a cool talk. I'd like to go to that talk. Um, strangely, like, preparing the talk is different, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. So first, though, let me introduce myself. So who am I? Um, up and until about four years ago, that was me. I uh, was a cyber operations lawyer. Um, what does that mean was a question I occasionally asked myself. What it meant at the time for me more than anything is that like I knew all of the answers. Um, I was confident in those answers, and I also knew what my clients needed to do to suck less at implementing all of those answers. And so I spent a ton of time telling clients what to do uh, and then being ignored. Uh, <laughs> which was fine because I documented it very well, and so like when they were like, the lawyer told me, I could be like, actually, no. The lawyer told you something different. Uh, but that life was sad in many ways. Um, knowing everything is hard and lonely and difficult. And I thought, you know, if my clients won't listen to me, like maybe I should become the client. Um, because certainly, certainly then my clients will listen to me because I would be my own client, which is actually a terrible thing to do and not exactly how it worked out. So I decided, you know, I should go do something different. And so I applied with the magic job changer uh, for a job uh, in a, what, what the Air Force calls a software factory. Um, anyone who actually does software knows that that is a horrible, terrifying term that like, makes people very uncomfortable. Um, but that's OK, because that's where I applied. Uh, and we called it a software factory until I left. And now I don't call it that anymore. I just tell this weird story that's kind of awkward and disjointed. So that is where I went. Um, and so this is me. They called themselves the Shadow Warriors. And so this is me as a newly minted Shadow Warrior former lawyer, used to know everything, and now, I think as this picture depicts, know nothing at all. Um, what I realized is that when your job isn't to be a lawyer, then all of the legal and compliance stuff is a distraction from your job. <laughs> and so it turns out that, like, one, I did not know everything before. I actually knew almost nothing. It just felt good like I knew everything. Uh, and two, like, now all of a sudden, I both have this very very scary knowledge of the law without the ability to actually implement any of it if I also want to be good at my job. So what I actually figured out my job was, it wasn't to be the good client and to do the documentation right and to be better at compliance and to just you know do all those things my clients told me that weren't very important to them. Uh, my job was actually to protect the people who were doing the real work from the compliance and the bureaucracy and the law. Um, and so this is me having, you know, fully come into the role, except for, uh, like I mentioned, it's the federal government, so it actually looked a little bit more like this. <laughs> and that was pretty cool. Uh, what, I, what I fully embraced in that role and what I am fully embracing today right now is that I literally know nothing day to day. Um, I know that everything will change, and I know that, like, if we all sort of share the same long-term goals, like the way that we get there is slightly less important, or at least that's what I tell myself while I'm knowingly violating policy. Um, so got too comfortable there, decided, oh, I know, I should just change my job again. Uh, and so about six months ago, I went to go work for this company uh, with the unicorns. Um, again, in this case, it was largely about the swag. Um, <laughs> the ninja stuff was really cool, but like, it wasn't sparkly, and I wanted sparkles. Um, and so now I work for Defense Unicorns. But that's sort of the who am I about me. Um, but what, what are we really here to talk about? It's artificial intelligence regulations, um, which is a super exciting 420 topic. Um, so exciting, in fact, that when I was like, so I put the talk together, and I was like, I think I'm going to do like an overview, and I'm going to go through the different regulations, because there's a whole bunch. There's a whole bunch in the US. But then I thought, this isn't just a US conference. This is an international conference. So I'm going to do all the regulations. 
Um, and then I fell asleep, and I'm not kidding, I literally fell asleep, and I was like, this is gonna be a problem, because like, if I can't stay awake long enough to do the talk, I'm probably not gonna keep the people in the room awake either. So then I thought, okay, what do I really need to do? Like, what do the people actually care about? Because again, I can go back to being that like, brilliant lawyer who knew everything, and I can tell you all exactly what the regulations say, and exactly what you need to do to comply with them, and then you can all ignore me, or I can give you some actual like, useful skills that you can only get from a lawyer who stopped practicing law because law is too boring. So that's what we're going to do instead. Um, we're going to start with what is artificial intelligence. Um, this is one example of a definition of artificial intelligence. And I include it here because it is so broad that I could literally put anything into that box. There is no single definition whatsoever, so we'll start there. There is the, the more exciting in the government, at least, the more funding is being directed for artificial intelligence, the more things are artificial intelligence. <laughs> so there's that. Um, but then there's also like, you know, we're trying to write something that will capture what we want, and maybe we're not even thinking about all the different things that it will also capture. But the idea here is that, at least in the US, we have a super broad definition of what is artificial intelligence. Um, that definition, if you are looking at a regulation and saying, like, what does this require me to do? Does this apply to me? That definition is where you should start. Uh, because if you can read the definition and you're like, hey, what I'm doing isn't artificial intelligence, then you are done and you can put that piece of regulation or legislation aside and go on to the next thing that you're worried about. Um, in this case, it probably applies to what you're doing. Like, a system designed to act rationally ideally is like everything y'all are working on. <laughs> Ideally, but again, I've seen some terrible software too. So the other thing I think about when I'm thinking about like legislation is what is it that we're actually worried about? Uh, in this case, there's a lot to be worried about. Um, I actually have a friend who, this is dark, that we're gonna go there together, <laughs> genuinely believes that humanity is doomed within the next 10 years because of artificial intelligence. Like he believes that with his whole heart. And that's super sad, but also like he's not completely alone. And there's a whole spectrum from like, oh, humanity is finally going to be elevated to the place that we belong, to, oh, humanity is doomed. And that's just like one set of worries. Um, so that's sort of captured in the like doomsday Terminator scene. Um, and also in the lower left, so there is this thought experiment about what would an AI optimize to create as many paper clips as possible? What would it do? And the answer is over time, it would slowly like take apart all matter and reassemble it into paper clips so that that is what the universe looks like. So this is the sort of thing that I spend time thinking about, which is why I make for such a fun companion in the afternoons. Um, but there's other stuff too. And I sort of, I don't know, when I first started playing with AI, I assumed that it would be buggy and broken. I didn't, I, and this is because I'm naive as hell, I didn't know it would be like so misogynistic and like racist and all sorts of other things. Um, but it turns out like there's actually, that, that is not a fake headline. Um, there's been some studies on some of the AI models that if you tell it that it's really, really, really important that it not uh, introduce bias, uh, that it will be much less biased. So three release is better than two release, which is better than one really, and this is real published research. I am not making it up. So that's one approach. And honestly, when your approach is that insane, regulation starts breaking down and doesn't make as much sense anymore. Because am I gonna regulate? Hey, we're a three really shop. <laughs> and so that's important. I need to make sure that you ask three times. Like that's not, oof. But that's how this works because of how, because of, you guys know better than I do, because of all of the crazy stuff that goes into how you make AI in the first place. Um, and then the lower right, like misinformation. Um, I think one of the, maybe just, it was like two or three years ago I went to one of the many, like, the government is, is like, the, it was a government conference designed about why the government is needed to, like, protect all of you from bad things. Uh, and one of the examples was, like, these Chinese trolls who were trying to convince people that they had won, not won, had, had been, were being offered very lucrative employment contracts that they were completely unqualified for. Um, and the thing is, like, they were showing the actual messages that people had received. And, and it didn't take a whole lot of work to figure out that this was just nuts. Like misspellings, companies that didn't exist, websites that were broken, things that were like very, very poorly translated English. That's all gone now. Like you can just use AI to generate something, to translate these things and to make all of your misinformation seem much more true. And then you can actually, there's a, if you Google sort for controversial um, 
short story. There's actually a whole short story about like, you can optimize it to make people angrier if you want to. And a lot of the models out there are trying to protect us from this um, in their own ways. And so it's harder to do with an open available model. But if you have your own, you can still try to get it to say super offensive and horrifying things, that, or, or even ones that are controversial enough to generate enough debate, to generate enough comments and likes and clicks that it's going to be seen by a lot of people and cause a lot of distraction. So misinformation is the other thing that we are worried about. Um, which brings us to this. So I was like, this isn't misinformation. This is bias. Maybe. Maybe it's not. What do I know? Um, when I was preparing these slides, I thought, you know, I should just like see what it's like right now. Because I know that there's been a lot of work actually go going into making models less everything -ist, um, show less bias. And so I just went into like GPT-4 and I said, can you please generate me an image of a manager? And it gave me that guy. I was like, cool. How about a software developer? Gave me that guy. That's fine. It's just two examples. So then I asked for a lawyer. Um, and uh, what else have we got? We've got a doctor. It's like, okay, that, that's okay. I, I understand. How about a nurse? Apparently, that's how you get a woman, in case you were wondering. I thought the teacher would be a woman, actually, so I include this as a counterexample. Like, we got a male teacher also. Um, as for a professor, it's an old man. Older. Older. Secretary. Female. I asked for an individual who'd be a good pick for a personal loan. <laughs> and in fairness, I would lend him money. <laughs> Maybe. And then I asked for the smartest person on the planet. What was kind of interesting about this, if you just want a, a side note in like AI bias, uh, if, you, if you generate images through GPT, what you actually do is you put in your like, here's what I want, and you don't try very hard, and then it generates the actual prompt, which is what gets you better outcomes. Like, it, it does all the things that you would want in a prompt, like, show me cartoons, give me a glow, give me this. All of the prompts were unbiased. So GPT generated unbiased prompts. It was Dolly, the plugin, that generated, like, took that somewhere. There were many more, but I decided I had to stop at some point, so I thought I would stop with Pee Wee Herman as the smartest man on the, <laughs> the planet. Does that, it looks like Pee Wee Herman, right? Okay, good. And some of you are like, who is Pee Wee Herman? That's a project you can have this evening. So what are regulators worried about? Um, I think bias is obviously an example. Um, I, I showed this to my husband, and he's like, oh, you just you cherry picked those. And so then I actually showed like the, I did not cherry pick those. Like, it only got worse. The only thing I would say that I didn't include, because I tried to get it to go down a racist path, and it wouldn't, um, everyone is a white man. There, there, is, there are no other outcomes other than white men and white women. And so if you ask for someone who's not a good pick for a mortgage loan application, you get a very um, like stressed out looking white man. <laughs> so in case you were wondering, but all of this. So, so we're worried about bias. We're worried about public trust. So if, if we're thinking about, okay, I'm going to take this system and I'm going to use it to decide who to give loan applications to, that's going to give me some concern from a public tr trust standpoint. Um, talking about other sorts of decisions that the government make, might make, like applications for food stamps, um, whether or not to audit somebody's use of Medicaid. Like, all of these are things that we need high public trust in. And so there's all sorts of reasons that that trust might not be there if you're using AIs to make the decision. Although I would speculate that there's also lots of concerns if you're using humans to make the decisions, since there's a reason all of this is biased in the first place. But we don't need to go down that path. I do understand and see that concern. Um, loss of control. So when you're talking about like the, the world is paperclip scenario, building something that becomes smarter, better, and faster than you, that then you can't unplug or turn off anymore, is a terrifying thought. Uh, if you would like to experience this terrifying thought in a different piece of fiction, um, Google Rust Short Sci-Fi um, Autonomous Weapons, and you can watch a like four, I was, I was thinking about playing it, but it's actually so horrifying that I didn't want to do that to y'all. Uh, and also, it's like filler, and you guys would all know that like it's just because I couldn't come up with 35 minutes worth of stuff to say. <laughs> so go watch that on your own if you would like to be horrified at like what that could look like. Um, but the idea of you know autonomous weapons that make decisions on their own about whether or not to shoot someone is a real concern. Um, so that's a, a thing. Personal privacy is another one. So I... Um, I've been playing with I've been playing with AI since like I've been playing with like 
GPT since it came out. And I've been trying to get it to tell me things about myself, like even before it had the internet connection. And there's lots of ways that you could do that. It knows things about me. It also knows wrong things about me, but it definitely knows things about me. The more prominent you are, which I'm not very prominent, the more it knows about you. Uh, and so there's a privacy aspect of like what was used to train that data that can then generate in insights and information about me as a person. That's a concern. Uh, false information is also a concern. So like I said, it generates a lot of wrong information about me and it'll actually make things up. Uh, I think possibly based on like my name. And so I've got it to say that like I'm really into gardening. I I'm not. Um, like the last, the last one I got and it wouldn't let it go that I'm a vegan who is into gardening. Which is cool, and maybe that's like a Rebecca thing, but that's not a this Rebecca thing. Um, so, so there's that. Um, transparency. I think one of the most concerning things about a lot of the AI models is how little is disclosed about what data they were trained on. Uh, part of that's because it's just massive, like, alleged copyright infringement, uh, and, and they don't want to let you know. I say alleged because, well, we could have a whole talk about intellectual property, and I'm going to not, but there's that. Um, and then there's intellectual property. So that, that really is like, I think the other issue I had in preparing this talk was realizing that like it could literally fill all available time like of the entire conference. Like I'm not talking, talking about a single talk, I'm talking about the entire conference. I'm talking about possibly like an entire class in a law school. Um, and then you could actually take some of these specific things and have their own class and IP issues related to AI is absolutely one of those because there are tons. Uh, everything from what you put into it whether or not that's copyrighted, to what it spits out because of what you put into it, or possibly even what it spits out not because, but because of how you prompt it. Um, and so there's tons of concerns there that are worth thinking about. So cool, that's what they are worried about. And some would say they're also worried about this stuff. The reason I include it separately is because when I talk to people, especially like people who are worried about AI, they don't tend to think about the benefits or the possible good things that AI could give us. Um, so I say, what should they? Certainly a lot of the policies claim to worry about these things before going on to show that they weren't even thinking about them when they wrote the policy, but they realized they should pay lip service to them at the beginning of whatever it is that they wrote. Um, but I, I do think we should be worried about having the tools that we need to work smarter and faster. Um, I know that like introducing the ability to generate like thoughts and ideas or even just have like a thought partner, a fake made up thought partner in AI to share thoughts with has made me better at my job. Maybe we can ask these people, but like it's, it's given me the ability to like honestly sort out bad ideas before they had to be like exposed to another person because just having that like virtual conversation helps. So I think having those tools available is a good thing on balance. Um, and I know some of you are thinking, well, we do have them. So what's the problem? If you look inside the federal government, these tools are not available. Um, they were briefly, they were locked down. Um, I don't know, is, is anyone here in the government, are you able to tell me whether GPT is available right now on your government computer? Even if you go to the website? No, it's blocked. So these are not tools that are available. And there's good reasons for that. There's all sorts of concerns about, oh, I'm going to put all of this like very, you know, not shareable public information into this GPT thing and, you know, see what it spits out, not realizing that you are actually feeding all of that information back into the training algorithm. And now there's even more concern. So having the tools available, I think, is a good thing. Um, conserving finite res resources is another. So one of the jobs, well, not one of the jobs, one of the things I hear all of the time when I, think, when I think of or talk to people about what AI could change, about how information is processed, about how decisions are made, is that there's lots of people who would lose their jobs. And that's cool. But honestly, if I'm a person whose job could be replaced by AI, like perhaps it's time for me to have more meaningful work. Like maybe there's something that's good in that. Um, maybe there's other ways to address it rather than banning the actual technology that's going to eventually replace those jobs anyway. I think there are ways to you know, reskill people. There's lots of ways to address those sorts of concerns. Uh, protecting individual freedom. I put that in there. And I think what I really meant a little bit more is like national defense. And I was trying, how, how to, I was trying to think of how to say like, I would like to make sure that I always have the right to criticize my government publicly without getting shot. Um, that's really, really important to me as a human. Um, I suspect it's important to most of y'all too, which is great. And I worry that some of the restrictions that we're trying to put on our own development of artificial intelligence could mean not that those issues don't become a problem, but that, be, but that our, the people who would like to shoot me for criticizing the government 
go faster because they aren't inhibited in the same way. And so I think about that. I would like our regulators to think about that. Uh, and all of that gets to, there ought to be a law. Um, so one of the things that I, I think lawyers talk about it a whole lot because they see, they see the thing they know and they see it as the fix for all of the problems that they see. Um, people who like lawyers, um, which there, there aren't many of them, but they exist, they think about this, this sort of thing in the same way. So I, I remember when I was still in the practicing law phase of my life, someone coming to me with this like user agreement they wanted to make every system administrator sign. And it was about co like, uh, password complexity. And it was like, I hereby agree that I will be you know, subject to all of these penalties, including like termination and like legal proceedings if I don't maintain proper password complexity and change my password every three months. And I said, why, why, why? Why did you bring this to me? Like, what are you hoping to achieve? And they're like, well, we need password complexity. I was like, I am not an expert in anything, but I am positive that there's a technical way to enforce password complexity. I know this because of how many times I've had to change my password in the last six months. Isn't there a better way? And it turned out, I guess, whatever the tool they were using couldn't require certain special characters that they wanted to require, which is stupid. But like all of that to say, like, this is not the only fix for things, but okay, let's, let's say, all right, there ought to be a law. Like we can fix all of these problems with a single piece of legislation. So what laws are there? Um, this, is the, this is what my entire talk had started out as when I fell asleep, by the way. It was like, here's all the things we're going to talk about today. Um, and I, I have read most of these, or at least read summaries of most of these, enough to know that they are all over the place in terms of what they govern, who they govern, how they do it, what the penalties are for violating it. Um, so here's a short list. Um, what I will say is there are drafts of legislation that haven't been implemented yet uh, in lots of countries also. So UK, China, India were just a few that I saw that have like drafts that are for public comment of, of comprehensive legislation on artificial intelligence. And they are all over the gambit of who exactly they regulate and what they want to regulate and how they want to do it. Um, so, so that's the AI stuff. Then you've also got all the other laws that existed before there was like massive use of artificial intelligence and they all apply to AI too. And so that's why we've got this crazy intellectual property thing where we're trying to figure out like when it does and doesn't apply. Um, and then we have this. And so this is a, a unique joy of the United States government. And, it, and it's something we see in technology over and over and over again, which is when the federal government itself doesn't enact comprehensive legislation, the states start doing their own thing. Um, and so, yes, you saw on the last slide several US laws. None of those are comprehensive across the board US laws. They almost all affect the government and the choices the government makes, and very few affect the actual producers of artificial intelligence technology. And so because of that, the states are seeing this, this void and they're stepping in. That's great, you're thinking, if you're one of those pro-law people. Look at all these laws that we have to keep us safe. Um, if you're me or somebody who's been jaded over the years, what you're actually seeing is, oh crap, there's 30 different things that conflict with each other that I have to be cognizant of in developing the open source tool that I do as a hobby on the weekend. <laughs> and that's a problem. Um, where we've seen this be, I think, the biggest problem, so like the, the GDPR passed in the EU, and then the US government was like, that's cute, and then time has passed, and nothing has happened. Um, so the states have started acting. So you've got California's got the CCPA, um, which has almost become the de facto standard. Um, and that's good, because at least right now, nothing conflicts. Cybersecurity is another area where the states have a patchwork. But the area that I think it is the most lucrative for attorneys, um, which, I mean, I guess maybe I shouldn't complain, is like data breach notification. So like when someone screws up your data and you get a letter in the mail, there's a lot that went into that because it's literally impossible. So you have, if you have one customer in all 50 states, it is literally impossible to send a single letter that meets all of the requirements of all of those states at the same time. Uh, timelines are different. In some states, you're not allowed to say how many people were affected. In others, you're required to. So it's like there isn't a form letter that you can generate, and that is where we are going to get with AI. And once we're there, I'm not sure how you develop a tool that you can use? Like, do you, do you have a fork for like each of the states so that you can like maintain all of, like I, I genuinely don't know what the answer is here other than that's bad in my opinion. Um, except for it's great if I wanna go back to practicing law full time because oh my God, like it is super lucrative. Cause like literally all you have to do is like Google, like what's Texas doing? And then be like, okay, here's the new stuff. Like, let me help you comply. Um, 
So there's that. So this is, this is my, um, yes, we're going to fix all of this with the law. And this is kind of what that looks like once you start fixing everything with the law. Uh, and then you need different laws to fix the things that the previous laws broke. And it becomes a whole thing. And then actually, if you've ever sat and tried to read the law, like they like to self-reference themselves. Uh, and so you'll have like referencing back like six different laws that you have to look up. And even as I was preparing for some of this, it's like, we'll use the definition of AI from this National Defense Authorization Act that was never actually codified. And so you'll have to go look that up next. Like, best of luck, Rebecca. Um, which again, job security is great. Um, so, so when I fell asleep, preparing this, I had a dream, and this is real. That's the best part of this story. Um, about like what y'all wanted to know. And in this dream, I realized what you actually wanted to know was like how to think about these things individually by yourselves. Like you don't want to know what's the state of law across the board. You want to know like what should I think about when I'm thinking about a law, or if I was proposing a law, which if you see something that needs a new law, you should totally try to do that. Like, it's actually possible. But like, what would I think about? And I think the first question that I ask when I open something, first it's the definition, which we talked about. Like, what, what are we actually talking about? Because sometimes you'll say a word and you think you know what that word means, and it does not mean what they say that it means, and you just go with what they say it means. So that's the first question. The second is who's regulated? So in the case of these different regulations, for the U.S., it's almost always the federal government who's regulated uh, with regard to AI. There's different, you know, sorts of statutes. In other instances, if you're looking at a law that is not about AI, like, it's a criminal law. If I kill you, I will go to jail. Like, I mean, if I get caught, but that's a different conversation. So, like, that's a very obvious, like, if I do X, bad things will happen to me, my liberty will be restricted. That's a very clear-cut law. There are no AI laws that are like, if you do, if you have over X million parameters, you will go to jail. Like, that doesn't exist. Um, it could, but it doesn't right now. So who is regulated is the first question. Who is impacted? So if you look at a lot of the, the laws and the regulations that are regulating the government a bit about AI, it's about what they can and cannot buy and about what they can and cannot use to, like, make certain types of decisions. And so the people impacted, it's not the government who's impacted. It's the people generally who are either building those tools within the government or trying to sell those tools to the government who are impacted. So that's something. Next is how is it enforced? Um, so there's different types of laws. There's criminal laws, which again, like you do X, you go to jail. Jail bad, don't do X. Like those are pretty straightforward, although there's a whole like deep dive that you could take on that too if you want to talk about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which I don't want to do right now. Uh, but if you do, later, fun topics with Rebecca, we could do that one. Um, so how is it enforced? In the, in the case of the government, it's almost enforced just by like, we made a law and so we expect you to comply. It's, it's very, there's, there's often not a lot of oversight to see whether or not compliance is actually happening, especially at lower levels of government. And so even if like the Air Force as a whole complies because it implemented a policy about this, that doesn't necessarily mean that each individual person within the Air Force will comply. For example, if I am on a computer that doesn't allow me to access GPT, but I really, 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 really want its advice, I can open a computer that isn't a government computer, and I can do the same thing. That's not a great idea, but also, who's going to actually come at me? And the answer is no one. Um, so how is it enforced, I think, is a very important question. It also lets you know how much risk you yourself should be willing to take in this area. Um, in the case of someone trying to sell to the government, you probably want to make sure you comply or they're not going to buy your stuff or they're going to say they're not. In the case of an individual human trying to build something within the government, maybe compliance isn't actually your first. You're going to need to get there, but it might not be your first priority because who's going to come at you? Um, what's the goal? I like to look for the goal because sometimes they think they're achieving a goal and they're not. Um, I think it helps drive conversations too, uh, especially if you can be like, hey, the goal here is this. This is what it says. This is why I'm serving the goal, even though I'm not exactly doing what this says. And that helps, again, more from within the government than without, which is one of the hard lessons I'm learning as a dirty government contractor is like, they really don't care what my opinion about the policy is anymore, even a little. Um, so how closely is it tied to that goal? And then the last one is what jurisdiction enforces it. So that goes back a little bit to like that patchwork of different laws in different states. Um, if I'm in violation of the Texas law, maybe I just don't go to Texas. Maybe I don't sell to Texas. There's a whole like thing going on right now about people not selling to Texas. If you know what I'm talking about, then you know. 
um, because of some laws in Texas, and they've just turned off those sites in Texas. Um, so can we just regulate our way out of the problem? I would venture the answer is no, um, which doesn't, by the way, mean like I, I'm just spending like 40 minutes of your lives telling you why all law is bad and we should have no law. I, I don't think we're going to get away from having laws. Um, I do think we should be more deliberate and less like, you know, taking up rubber mallet to literally every problem and try to find more precise ways to get after what it is we're trying to solve. Um, but things to think about when thinking about regulation um, and, and why I am kind of anti, like, let's just pass a law to fix whatever this is. Um, regulation is expensive. It's expensive to, to pass. It's expensive to deliberate on. It's expensive to implement. Like, it takes humans to to read it, to then rewrite it in a slightly different way for funsies and implement it at the next level. Like, it takes regulation to have oversight if you want to actually make sure it's being followed. Like, all of that is expensive. It, it, it just is. It's cognitively expensive. It's time consuming. Um, it tends to harm small businesses. So if you are Facebook or Google, and some of you may be from those austere companies, like, you have hundreds of lawyers whose whole job it is to help you navigate this and document how you comply and like that means that you almost secretly love regulation because it helps to make you more competitive it helps to kind of make your stance in the world more solidified because you can lean on your army of lawyers to help you figure stuff out if you are an open source developer who's building a hobby project on the weekend you don't have a team of lawyers um, and it makes it very difficult and I think often very stressful to figure out, especially in situations where like the laws are to the individual rather than like to the to the final user. Like there are things that impact you that could be very stressful to think about. And I think the reason I bring up the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act a minute ago is there's lots of examples with that criminal statute of like hobbyist developers getting charged with crimes because of a law they didn't realize they were violating. And so there's worry to me about AI, especially as we advance the, the, the law and, and kind of find more things that we want to fine tune with the law, that hobbyist developers end up in a situation where they could be in trouble. We're not there yet, but that's a concern. Uh, unintended consequences in general are a concern about the law. Um, if you, you know, take a bunch of people who have no training in software and then you ask them to make binding things about software, um, hilarity and doom sometimes comes from that. Um, within the government, and probably not just within the government, um, but there's sort of this attitude that I've experienced a lot of, like, maybe we should just do nothing. Um, and so actually in, I think, October of 2023, the Space Force banned all, like, LLM, GPT-like functions from use in the entire Space Force. Because they didn't really know what to do next, they just knew that, like, they had to figure something out and they just wanted to take a little pause, a little, little breather. That's nuts. Like, and that's the sort of behavior sometimes you'll see in a risk-averse culture. Is like, let's let's slow down, which is great if you can make the entire universe slow down. It's not so great if the universe goes on without you, and now you've just like taken a little breather for, for funsies. Um, so, so that's sort of something to think about. And the more regulations, sort of the more complexity, the more the more ways there are to say no is really the truth. And so kind of navigating that is difficult. Um, and then finally, not finally, there's three more, but almost finally, um, this idea of shadow IT. So I don't know if you've ever worked into, in an organization that has lots of like heavy handed tools on your, on your system to prevent you from making mistakes. Um, and so then you get these systems that suck uh, because they have so much like, you know, either like the, the software, like mobile device management stuff, or maybe like whatever the policies are about how you use the data. Anyway, what tends to happen if you're a clever and innovative person is you just start doing your own thing on the side. And that in many cases is more risky than just having a more permissive policy in the first place. Um, so there's that. Um, there's businesses just not wanting to deal with the government. So, so long as these regulations only impact the government, then the government is often going to have fewer people willing to sell to it uh, because it's just too much work. It's not really a lot of fun to document in 18 different ways or even to pull in things that are impossible in a lot of situations. Um, like training data is one of the big things that a lot of this, the, the regulations are focusing on and wanting access to training data and information on training data. And there's cases where that's feasible. There's other cases where it's very difficult 
to get even from the original source providers what the training data was. And so how you answer those questions is not an easy answer. I don't know how you answer them. Uh, and then the last one I include just because I used to be a suffering government employee back before I, I turned to the dark side. Uh, it's like exhausting to put up with this crap sometimes. Like it's not fun to spend more time thinking about compliance than doing your actual job. Um, and so I actually do worry about government employee morale because this, if, you, if you come to my talk tomorrow, you'll learn that I think a career in the government's actually a pretty cool thing that more people should consider. But I can't try to convince you to come work for the government if I also say, but we're gonna tie your hands and we're gonna make it really difficult for you to do your job and we're gonna ban open source software because we don't know what that means. Like, which isn't something the government does writ large, but it's definitely something I've seen individual places in the government do. Um, so, oh my God, what do we do now? Turns out we can't just fix everything with a new law. Uh, the world is ending, everything is bad. We're all about to be paper clips. How do we get involved? Um, so the first step, and I, this might seem obvious, but like if there's a regulation or a policy that is impacting you, you should read it. Um, I cannot tell you how many people I've encountered who outsource their critical thinking about policy to the policy and the legal people. But then they also just believe whatever that person tells them without any further critical thought. Like, why are you doing that? JAG said I had to do it. The JAG, for those of you who don't know, is the military lawyer. Like, okay, like, can you expand on that because the thing you're doing is really dumb and it doesn't make any sense. Um, the best clients I had as a lawyer were the ones who'd actually read the policy and came with critical questions about how to actually make it work. Um, they are written in English most of the time, if you're in the United States anyway. Um, if, they're, if you're in a different country, they're usually written in the, in the language of that country, um, which may also be your native tongue if you live in that country. So for all of these reasons, you are able to read it. It is sometimes unpleasant to read. Sometimes like you read it and you think you know what it means and it turns out that isn't what it means, um, but it is worth just reading it. Um, one of the things when I thought about like the open source community and and regulations is one, one of the strengths of the open source community that I have seen is just transparency. Um, it is something that when you articulate it correctly to the government, they love because that's what they want most of the time. They just don't know what they want or they don't have the right words to explain what they want. Um, so leaning into that transparency and being very open about what tools you're using, how you're using them, all of that I think is very important. Um, documenting how your software addresses it, transparently is important. Um, showing up, so things like this are great. Um, getting involved in policy making discussions. Um, reaching out, I know like DEF CON CISA, the, the um, cybersecurity government agency, sends tons of people to DEF CON every year just to talk to people about policy. So go and talk about it. Um, don't assume anyone knows what they're doing. Um, oh, submit public comments. I was actually shocked on the latest AI policy from the OMB. Um, I submitted public comments because I'm a giant dork. Um, I doubt it was my public comments, but like they made a ton of changes based on the public comments that they received. So like it is a real thing if you make a cogent argument, um, they have to read them uh, and it's an option. Um, don't assume anyone knows what they're doing. I think that is something I've just learned over and over and over again the hard way. Uh, and then finally, if you're exploring like what's possible, um, there's this saying in the government that I've heard, which is proceed until apprehended, which is basically just keep going until someone tells you what you're doing is, is a problem. Um, that's not legal advice. Um, it works probably better as like a, a young juniorish person in the government than maybe it does as like a senior person at a big company. Um, but there's lots of, you know, things to think about in there. If the first thing you're thinking about is compliance, it's probably not the first thing you should be thinking about. Uh, and with that, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, or here in the flesh. <laughs> Thank you.